Good afternoon uh, for those that are in my time zone. And uh, good morning for those that are either ahead of me, ahead of us, or behind us. It is indeed uh, a pleasure to have you in this very important session. And uh, let me take this opportunity on behalf of the African Society for Laboratory Medicine, uh, Foundation for Innovative New Diagnostics, Africa CDC, teams that have uh, come together to organize this important uh, DNO sub uh, COP uh, session. Also appreciate the member states that uh, they have taken time to prepare uh, and who also make uh, their submissions in terms of uh, experience sharing for, for this session. We greatly appreciate uh, your contributions that you have made through uh, this experience session on these uh, platforms. Uh, colleagues, as you are aware that uh, ensuring access to disease testing at the right time and also at the right place for all those who are in need for this test is, has always been known and documented as an effective and cost efficient way of ensuring that um, we uh, manage diseases and also some of the public health challenges that we have. However, having this in place has proved to be a major challenge for the majority of our governments, particularly us here uh, in Africa. If you look at the Lancet report, it has some very uh, disturbing figures. It is reported there that about 47% of the global population has little to no access to diagnostics. This um, is quite disturbing, as I've said, and it calls for action uh, and it cannot be uh, business as usual. Now, when you look at the 20, 2016 World Health Assembly resolution on strengthening diagnostic capacity, um, there are many other things that uh, member states are aged to do. Among us, these include one, developing integrated networks to tackle all diseases and medical challenges, uh, avoiding what we currently have, which are siloed approach. It also aged member states to develop national essential diagnostic lists and extend the scope of packages of essential diagnostic services to even the lowest level where our communities are. It also urged uh, member states to make essential diagnostics available, to make them accessible, and most importantly, to make them affordable at the primary care level. And lastly, it urged member states to invest in developing skilled workforce at all levels of their respective health systems, such that these health systems can then be able to support advances in diagnostics and management uh, of these technologies. As ASLM, we have also been taken up this with leadership in the continent with such forums like the Lab Directors Forum that seeks to bring together African continental leaders, leaders in laboratory services in order to uh, inform and shape the laboratory agenda at the highest level and also participate in defining priorities and most importantly, harness individual country strengths, capabilities, and successes to further build the laboratory capacity in Africa, which is also exemplified in this panel that we have together, where we are looking at the success stories from other member states to ensure that uh, we exchange uh, knowledge to ensure that we all develop together and no one is left behind. When you look at all these efforts, they are there to ensure that diagnostic systems are rapidly able to respond to emerging infectious diseases. Towards this goal, there have been various forms of geospatial analysis that are being used increasingly and also deployed by countries in order that they continue to effectively collect data in almost close to real time so that it can inform and improve policies, improve planning, and improve implementation of lab systems intervention. Of course, thanks to the support from the partners such as ASLM, Africa CDC, Global Fund, Global Fund, and Find, we have supported in this initiative, either resource-wise in providing the technical expertise that is required. This DNO subcommittee of practice, which is convening us today, was established by ASLM and Find within the, the overall LabCorp, um, uh, uh, um, the LabCorp community, which it was established to enable knowledge sharing, 
in this evolving field that include many learnings and many best practices that are coming from real life situations in countries. This is a sure way of ensuring that we promote wide adoption of data-driven planning by countries, especially as they do their program and planning. In previous sessions, we've heard countries share their perspective experiences, share their um, analysis they've done, and also share findings in details on how these uh, has informed their laboratory system strengthening uh, and development. Geopartial analysis and optimization of lab systems to uh, these require time, they require resources, and also they require personnel who are the boots uh, on the ground required to do the data gathering. We need the technical skills for data analysis, as well as ensuring that we have some dedicated staff that can uh, work on a day-to-day -day basis, given our constraints and resources in our countries. In this session, we wanted to focus our discussion today on this aspect and try to tackle the question, does DNO meet its promise that we have given to member states that we have spoken about for a long time? In terms of value addition, does it bring the value addition it brings to countries who have adopted this geospatial uh, analysis? How has it worked in terms of network planning as well as strengthening their diagnostic uh, systems uh, as countries. Now, in our panel discussion today, we have representatives from the ministers of health from several countries, including Cote d'Ivoire, Mozambique, Zambia, and Zimbabwe. And we've asked them to share their rich experiences and also how they've leveraged on their DNO programs, how they've leveraged on other geopartial systems like your lab mapping um, in order to strengthen laboratory efforts, and uh, they will be sharing with us in this session. We have three main objectives in this uh, uh, session today. One, we would like to put a spotlight on different approaches and forms of geospatial analytics, which is based on diagnostic network planning and optimization. Secondly, we would also like during our discussions and the submissions that the countries will do to unpack the requirements, the successes, and most importantly, some of the limitations that these member states have met in adopting these methods and ensure that we work together efficiently in strengthening our diagnostic systems given our resource limited settings. And lastly, we would also want to identify recommendations for what countries need to advance their, what they need in order to advance their diagnostic systems and strengthening efforts using some of these uh, geospatial analytics. And to help me today, we have two uh, co-moderators who will lead you in this session today. We have Patrick Royley from Global Fund and Dr. Aitene uh, from Africa CDC. If I can just give uh, a, a brief introduction to them. Uh, Dr. Aitene Ashnef is currently a senior program manager at Africa CDC, and uh, he takes the role, leading role in lab system strengthening and networks. He's a biomedical scientist by profession, and has been working in this space for more than 15 years. He holds a PhD in biomedical sciences and also a master's degree in medical chemistry from Addis Ababa University and St. Petersburg University, where he also has a master's degree um, uh, for, in public health. Uh, we also have uh, Patrick Loy, who serves as the lead for lab system integration uh, at the Global Fund for, uh, to fight uh, AIDS, TB, and malaria. Patrick has been uh, with the Global Fund since 2019, and uh, initially uh, as a cost-efficient advisor, investing cost efficiencies of lab commodities, and he later joined the RISHH lab team to manage the 2021 to 2023 strategic initiative in lab systems uh, health security. He currently manages a catalytic investment portfolio, which supports uh, close to 46 countries and three regional institutions as they work towards adopting best practices in innovative solutions to avoid to uh, advance uh, lab systems. Uh, Patrick holds a BA in politi political science from York University. He also holds a master's in public health from the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, and also a postgraduate uh, graduate certificate in the intellectual property law for medicine from Queen Mary University of London. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome. Um, uh, help me to welcome 
my co-moderators who will lead you through uh, uh, this session. Let me thank you for once again for finding time to join us. And at this moment, I'll hand you over to Patrick to take you through the session. Patrick, over to you. Thank you very much, Dr. Marusa. It's a pleasure to be with you today and, and thank you to ASLM and Find for organizing this session. Over the past two decades, the Global Fund has invested in building laboratory infrastructure and ensuring that laboratories are well equipped with the resources and personnel to support the fight against HIV, TB, malaria, and other diseases. In 2023, we invested 142 million US dollars in expanding and strengthening uh, laboratory and diagnostics cap uh, capacities and capabilities. This included investments in network design, geospatial analysis, and network optimization. Countries eligible to receive Global Find financing are strongly encouraged to routinely conduct integrated diagno diagnostic network assessment and optimization exercises to increase the efficiency of the laboratory networks and systems and inform investments in diagnostics uh, and laboratory systems going into the future. Insights from DNO can contribute to evidence-based integrated national strategic plans, funding requests to the Global Fund and other partners, resource allocation, as well as procurement and operational planning. It's therefore very encouraging to see countries readily adopt geospatial analytics approaches tailored to their unique settings, each undertaking analysis in response to their individual purposes, their objectives, scope, and timing. Today, from our panelists, we'll hear about how those individual purposes, objectives, and scopes of analysis have enabled enhanced planning, where analysis has the potential to facilitate the transition towards integrated systems, and how outputs of analysis have developed an ongoing and dynamic approach to maximize testing capacity and access to services. It's my privilege to introduce our panelists who represent four ministries of health and countries which have undertaken varying levels of geospatial analysis mapping and network optimization. I'd like to extend a warm welcome to Nshimba Mwansa and Judith, Judith uh, Bizieche from the Ministry of Health, Republic of Zambia. Dr. Guy Damien Adagra of the Ministry of Health, Republic of Cote d'Ivoire. Dr. Felix Pinto and Tishira Chongo of the Ministry of Health, Republic of Mozambique. And finally, Vincent Campira of the Ministry of Health and Child Care, Republic of Zimbabwe. I'll now hand over to my co-moderator, Dr. Ayatenio Ashinafi, to open the discussion with our panelists. Over to you, Ayatenio. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Patrick. And um, I appreciate everyone being here today. And uh, my, my first question directed to uh, Dr. Flix Pinto and Chongo from, from Mozambique. And the utilization of LAMAP data in, it is, is essential for the analysis and enhancement of laboratory systems in networks throughout Africa. And this initiative seeks to improve uh, public health, uh, you know, access to testing facilities while establishing sustainable monitoring and evaluation processes. Uh, please share with us what were your expectations from the analysis? How did it align with your country broader vision for improving diagnostic testing uh, of, of a LAMA. Uh, okay, uh, good afternoon to everyone. First of all, I want to thank uh, ASLM to invite us uh, as Mozambique, uh, Teixeira Shongo and I, to be a representative of, of the entire team in country. And uh, this uh, lab map activity was very interesting in uh, uh, different ways from human resource uh, perspective, uh, as well uh, to uh, collaborative uh, perspective among institutions. We're talking about ASLM, uh, Mozambique, uh, and within country provinces. And uh, uh, it creates a, a huge uh, expectation not only uh, within our team, but also uh, the partners uh, or stakeholders that operate uh, in uh, health sector uh, from different agencies and uh, uh, other donors like uh, the Global Fund and uh, uh, others. And uh, one of the things that we saw 
was to uh, leverage uh, and uh, have the uh, uh, the picture of the country how we uh, have uh, uh, the services distributed and compare with uh, uh, the um, uh, the population that has, uh, it's uh, uh, seated in, in country. The expectation was uh, uh, have this clear picture of how a lab network is uh, well distributed and if it's merged with the uh, uh, population also uh, distribution and how or what we're going to see also it's linked to uh, uh, our strategic plans and uh, uh, decisions that we have to to make and uh, uh, after all of that one of the uh, key uh, uh, aspects that we uh, listed was to uh, be able to update our strategic plan as we are finishing uh, our uh, cycle of uh, uh, strategic plan and as well to optimize the entire uh, network and those gaps that we have because Mozambique has one uh, comprehensive sample referral system uh, uh, approach where uh, we are collecting the uh, clin clinical samples and public health related samples across the country. We, we have 11 uh, uh, provinces and more than 160 districts and we are uh, collecting samples of all those uh, uh, districts and uh, we have more than um, than 4,000 routes and we uh, 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 have uh, millions of kilometers that we uh, are doing from uh, uh, different points of the country and one of the uh, aspects was to see if these labs are uh, uh, overlapping or cover the what we are seeing in terms of sample referral uh, system because we're collecting for, for instance a uh, uh, month's sample uh, uh, TB, HIV, anatom pathology, and uh, all those uh, samples. And was a great tool in our perspective to upgrade uh, the, the, the way we want to see the lab uh, area in the future and how we can uh, uh, also um, uh, put in a context, not only in terms of infrastructure, but as well, we are talking about climate change, we are talking about uh, seasonality, and based on seasonality, how we can manage to have this kind uh, of uh, different facilities to help one another during this uh, period of, of the time. And uh, finally, it was important to, uh, to assess all the gaps and needs uh, to help not only uh, the the lab area, but also the um, health sector uh, has it all uh, to address the future uh, uh, plans. Because one of the things that uh, are in our understanding that the, uh, this approach should bring is to start uh, uh, thinking in uh, health uh, health network has uh, uh, different health areas. Uh, and uh, uh, build health areas and health networks based on also our uh, uh, lab networks to improve the final uh, results and also to be able to get uh, uh, maximum results from, from the lab. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Flex, and uh, thank you for sharing your experience. So as we engaged in this important discussion, uh, I invite the panelists from, from Zimbabwe, Zambia, and then Cote d'Ivoire to contribute any significant insights or uh, alternative viewpoint based on, based on your experience. Let me invite uh, Zimbabwe or Zambia or Cote d'Ivoire. Any of country can step in. Uh, good to, afternoon. To share. Yeah, go ahead, please. Yes. Uh, so this is this is Judith from from Zambia, and uh, just uh, to 
to add to what uh, to the submission by uh, Mozambique on the lab map uh, activity that uh, they conducted. So Zambia as well, we did um, conduct a, a lab map and um, we did uh, get quite a, a, a lot of insights that have uh, helped us to, to actually see the gaps or identify the gaps that are in our laboratory system. Because for us as Zambia, why we, we, we had to now think of conducting a lab map was uh, we wanted to understand uh, the functionality of our labs uh, in, in, in the network. We did have a number that were uh, functional, the others were not. And also to also just get uh, the capacities, the testing capacities that uh, were available in the private sector as well as uh, uh, in the animal health sector. So that is uh, what uh, we were looking at at Zambia. And uh, from what we got, it was really um, eye-opening and uh, I'm sure it will definitely guide uh, our policy going forward. That is what I can contribute to Mozambique's uh, submission. Thank you very much. Okay, Judith, I think uh, it's a very good experience. Is there any Zambia, I mean, uh, Zimbabwe or Cote d'Ivoire? All right. So uh, thank you. I think uh, the in Mozambique and in Zambia to share experience. What I hear everyone have been saying, the, the laboratory network distribution and the linkage of uh, a lab of information uh, into the strategic plan, and including also the optimization of the networks that has been taking place in, in, in Zimbabwe, I mean, in, in Mozambique. So Zambia is going to be far uh, ready to learn the testing capacity. And you are looking at um, how far the LAMA is really uh, supporting the laboratory functions and, and, and the like. So um, thank you, I, I think, all the uh, panelists to share your experience. And let, let me proceed to the next question directed to Vincent Kambera from Zimbabwe. And, uh, Utilizing LAMAP data to conduct a comprehensive uh, analysis aimed at enhancing population accessibility to test facilities while establishing robust and, and sustainable long-term monitoring and evaluation processes. This initiative not only focuses on identifying gaps in the laboratory services, but also seeks to inform strategic planning for equitable distribution of diagnostics resources, ultimately improving public health outcomes across uh, diverse communities. So uh, my question is uh, directed to Vincent. What do you think this geospatial analysis uh, add more, most values? And where, where there are any aspects that fail short for expectation? Those of you felt were uh, challenging to achieve. Uh, Vincent, over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ateneo. Uh, what I would say is um, the geospatial analysis uh, was very um, engaged. And when you look at the data set from the lab mapping exercise, it's a very big data set with many variables. And the nature of the data is not necessarily to infer causality or rather identify linear or non-linear relationships among the variables, or maybe think of multivariate analysis, but it's basically descriptive in nature so that you can describe the current picture of the country uh, with respect to those variables like registration, accreditation, pieces of equipment within the network, laboratory personnel, staff complement, a lot of issues within that data set. I just mentioned a few. So this analysis uh, that we did in country gave us a lot of insights. I will just um, highlight a few key insights that we got from the analysis. Uh, this included um, highlighting gaps in testing capacity, the available testing capacity in the country versus the country priority diseases across the tiered system, that is from the lower tiers 
to the upper tiers. For Zimbabwe, we have a five tiered diagnostic network. It also gave us insights in terms of the testing menu that is available within the tiers, both um, looking at the public sector and also the animal and environmental health sector. And also, it gives insights to the testing menu that is available within the private laboratories in Zimbabwe, because the mapping exercise included public labs, environmental labs, animal health labs, as well as private laboratories. Um, it also gave insights in terms of the milestones that the country has achieved uh, in terms of implementing quality management systems. We are looking at how many labs are accredited in the country, uh, how many labs are moving towards achieving accreditation. And also it gives insights in terms of the key pieces of equipment in the country, in the diagnostic network, and how those pieces of equipment are distributed. And this also speaks to um, immediate capacity in terms of the tests provided. And also um, to add on, within the analysis, as we did the analysis, uh, we also noted as a country that there is need to have in-country capacity in terms of performing data analysis so that in future exercises, as a country, you are able to continuously analyze your data and make data-driven decisions. Uh, to some of the things um, that was challenging, was the non-alignment in terms of the tiered structure of the public health laboratories versus the animal health labs, the environmental health labs, and the private sector. The way the public tiered system is structured and the way the other labs are structured. And it is um, something that needs to be fixed at country level where we are going to try and harmonize and have private laboratories, animal health labs, and environmental health labs fitting into the national tiered structure. This is something that will require a lot of engagement from the private sector and also the public sector focusing on the One Health approach. Nowadays, we talk of the One Health approach. And you find that uh, as a country, we are also working towards revising the National Laboratory Strategic Plan and also the One Health Strategic Plan so that these national documents speak to each other. And also we are achieving part of the action items that emanated from the laboratory mapping exercise. Thank you. Thank you very much, Vincent. Uh, thank you for, uh, for sharing your experience. And broadly, you mentioned the the variables, the LAMAP variables, and including the tiers uh, level of uh, uh, laboratories. You mentioned as well the public, private, environmental, and, uh, and, and animal laboratories, which have been really very critical and to get uh, information and know about the lab capacity of uh, those labs. And uh, you, you, you just highlight very key important point that uh, main the laboratories, uh, equipment placement and locations, including to understand about the level of the quality management systems and when, uh, how many labs have been uh, implementing uh, quality and other parameters. Of course, as you know, the LAMAP uh, data variables are very broader and it could be uh, really uh, uh, understand about the level of the lab capacity in, in, in the country. Thank you very much. I, I would like to extend you know, an invitation to the panelists as well. And uh, the same questions that uh, from from Mozambique and uh, Zambia, Cote d'Ivoire, uh, to share any 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 valuable insights or differing perspectives that stem from from your your experience. I just open up. Uh, I, I think uh, a question to 
to Mozambique and Zambia and Cote d'Ivoire. Uh, am I audible, Shimba, from Zambia? Yes. Yeah, go ahead, please, Shimba. Yeah, the, the lab mapping we did also added the more variable information to uh, the analysis we have been doing in our network. Initially, we did the a diagnostic networking also analysis using the OPT-DX, but we noticed that there are certain gaps and certain information that uh, was not collected and also analyzed. But when we did the lab mapping, although our analysis is just in a preliminary stage as at now, we have identified a lot of gaps. For example, we have identified the inadequacies with regards to power backup in some of the facilities. And if you look at the situation we are facing in Zambia, we have limited power currently, but also that is very important for us to have power backup. And this has also been highlighted that there's also inadequate power backup as well as solar system in some of the facilities, which is an important gap for us to ensure that we address. Also, because of the aspect of the One Health approach, Vincent also highlighted too, we also incorporated mapping the veterinary laboratories. But one thing we also noticed is that the health laboratories are well structured when it comes to the supply chain system. Then veterinary is not well defined and the, there are weaknesses that needs also to be strengthened. That is some of the information we have also noticed. Apart from that, the health facility structure, we noticed that they are tiered into health center uh, level one, two, and three. But when we looked at the veterinary, the structure is not well defined. There is no actual policy also highlighting to that. And these are some of the things that came up to ensure that the Ministry of Agriculture also comes up with a policy that will also help the uh, the veterinary laboratories to have a structured tier in which they can also refer their samples. So these are some of the things that have just been added value from the preliminary analysis that we have done so far out of the lab map uh, data from Zambia. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Shumba from Zambia. It's a very good experience. Make use of the lab map data, expanding uh, the, the diagnostics network. That is very critical that uh, the previous gaps can be fulfilled uh, while you are implementing a lab map information and uh, this is this is a very good lesson. Those who are really uh, part of uh, this discussion. So, is there any other? With interest of time, I'm just uh, closing my session here, and I will hand over to to Patrick. Patrick, over to you, please. I, I think we do have a hand from uh, Guy Damien. Okay, go ahead. Idamia, did you want to provide Idana, a response? please uh, go ahead, please. Yeah. Salut. Merci bien. Bonjour à tous. Uh, vous m'entendez, j'espère. Vous m'entendez? Allô? Vous m'entendez? Oui, oui, oui. Merci. Oui. Merci. Oui. Uh, C'est un réel plaisir pour moi de participer à ce panel. Effectivement, l'analyse DNO qui a été conduite en Côte d'Ivoire nous a été très, très profitable parce que ça rentre dans la vision même du ministère de la Santé qui a pour ambition de créer des pôles régionaux d'excellence sanitaire de sorte que les patients dans les, dans les régions éloignées ne soient pas obligés de venir à Abidjan, à la capitale, pour bénéficier de certains soins. Donc, ça permet d'équilibrer les capacités diagnostiques des, des régions à partir des plateformes qu'on a, qu a vues. Donc, euh, on a pu, à partir des données, euh, mettre en évidence des opportunités de diagnostic proches en mutualisant les équipements. Et puis, vraiment faire une bonne... Ça a permis à, aux différents programmes quand même de travailler maintenant en équipe plutôt que de, de travailler de façon solitaire dans son, dans, 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 son, dans son coin. Voilà, ça a permis de créer une famille en sorte que tous les programmes qui peuvent bénéficier des équipements. En tout cas, on travaille désormais en équipe et ça nous a permis de mettre en place un système de transport intégré d'échantillons. Et aussi, on est encore, on allait au-delà de la santé humaine pour créer maintenant un système de transport avec les produits des vétérinaires et puis aussi environnementaux. Voilà. En tout cas, 
On est encore dans la phase pilote. J'avoue que ce n'est pas si facile que ça. Parce que, comme l'a dit ma prédécesseur, les problèmes d'électricité, ça, c'est un gros défi en Côte d'Ivoire aussi. Et puis, le problème d'Internet, le retour des résultats rapides, c'est un problème aussi, parce que le tout n'est pas couvert en Internet. Et le, le trafic routier, le réseau routier, oui. Euh, en théorie, on voit peut-être 10 km, on peut penser qu'on va faire ça en 10 minutes, mais il euh, y a des zones vraiment où on se tape une heure pour parcourir 10 km. Et surtout en zone de pluie, en, en période de pluie, c'est encore difficile. Mais ça nous permet quand même de, de, d'ajuster et puis trouver des solutions appropriées à chaque site voilà, et, et les accompagner. En tout cas, on est encore dans la dynamique de, 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 de faire ce système-là. Mais j'avoue que c'est, c'est vraiment intéressant. C'est ce que je peux dire pour moi. Merci. Thank you very much. Uh, I think... Uh... Uh, panelists, I mean, a panelist from, from Côte d'Ivoire, it's a very good information. You mentioned about the, the program, uh, people have been collaborated, and you highlighted some of the critical problems, and that has been identified through the LAMA program, and uh, in terms of, uh, you know, transportation systems and the like. And uh, thank you so much for sharing uh, your experience and challenges in, in Côte d'Ivoire. Thank you, uh, Guia, again. So I just, uh, if there is no any other panelists who are able to say something, otherwise I'll hand over to Patrick. All right. So Thank Patrick, over to you, please. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Judith and uh, Nishimba, you, you've both alluded to some of the uh, the benefits that you've seen from DNO and the changes in planning and decisions. Uh, your experience with DNO has been presented in a very compelling paper published in, in PLOS and PLOS uh, Global Health, in which you unpack how a network optimization approach enabled you to inform the scale up uh, of integration of TB and HIV testing on gene expert platforms to meet the future test demand and reduce turnaround time for priority HIV testing. Did DNO bring any changes to how planning or decision around diagnostics are made in Zambia? Could you share some insights there as to uh, whether in your opinion, those changes were worth the investment and the effort required to gather a significant amount of information and analyze multiple scenarios? Thank you very much. uh... Patrick. So uh, for Zambia, we have actually done uh, two DNOs. And uh, the, the one where we did uh, the publication, that was our first uh, uh, DNO that we did in 2021. And uh, when we, we actually did it, it was at a point that um, there was a uh, um, uh, a push that countries should start considering uh, integrating um, their testing, and uh, for Zambia, we were we were then moving. For, we were at a point where the the, the HIV testing was um, done at a centralized uh, points, and uh, then we had uh, the TB, which was being done uh, at uh, uh, at uh, decentralized uh, locations near yeah, which were closer to the to the patients and now that we we were thinking of uh, integration we had to do that uh, dno and um based on the questions the key questions that we we we, we were trying to answer in that uh, dno we actually got uh, the benefits of it because uh, we wanted to see first of all what we wanted to see was um if the current utilization of our gene expert machines was uh, adequate to accommodate uh, the extra uh, testing from the, the other programs. And uh, also like you've mentioned to get to an acceptable turnaround time, we didn't want to get to to integrate testing and then have these um, uh, long turnaround times. We needed to maintain the, the point of care turnaround time, which was by then was uh, one day. And um, we also looked at the, the staffing capacities 
which was uh, quite informative because uh, we did have uh, from the output, we did have facilities where we have a lot of, um, we have adequate uh, HR or human resource to do the testing, but uh, we didn't have uh, uh, enough uh, equipment capacity and vice versa. So that uh, those are some of the things that, uh, that uh, the DNO now informed us as a as a lab program on what uh, uh, to do. So when we got the the output or from that uh, first uh, DNO actually, and uh, we implemented uh, the recommendations as they were, we did actually now see uh, an improved uh, lab uh, TAT of one day and patient TAT of two days. That is uh, on the viral load and EID side because the TB was already at one day and uh, the TB was maintained actually at one day. Then we had our courier, it became more functional because as we integrated the testing, we also integrated our sample referral system. So we saw that uh, we now had uh, this um, a system which made us, which uh, gave us some uh, uh, some cost savings in terms of now we were using the same uh, riders to do the to to move uh, all the sample types, and uh, we were also saving on the um, on the equipment through the reagent rentals because uh, for Zambia, like for the point of care machines. We do have a service level agreement, which is uh, based on our uh, volumes. So now that we had high volumes or high number of um, uh, tests being done on these other, on the point of care platforms, the cost per program now reduced. And uh, based on uh, these uh, um, benefits that we did actually get after implementing uh, this, uh, the DNO uh, output, we, we saw the benefit. And uh, yes, uh, the, these uh, changes actually, the, 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 the recommendations, they were worth it. And uh, the investment was, uh, was, actually, was actually worth it. And uh, from that uh, experience that we had, uh, we saw that uh, this is a good investment. We even now have uh, a policy that, um, yeah. um, that now speaks to our multi-disease uh, testing platforms that when we are placing, we don't just place them anyhow, we have to use the, we have to place them according to the DNO recommendation, which is, because uh, we have seen the, the, the benefit that uh, now our equipment is being utilized, because we are coming from a space where like uh, for the, uh, I'll use an example of the gene expert machine, the utilization was at uh, at an, uh, an average of uh, 25%, and now it went up to above, uh, we are now above uh, 50 in most of the facilities. And in some we've gone even above 100% utilization because of that uh, following the recommendations uh, from, uh, from, the, from the DNO. And uh, at the time, like uh, for 2024, now that um, we had seen, we were monitoring our system after when, uh, whilst we were implementing these uh, recommendations and we did see an increase where now we even started getting feedback from the facilities that uh, they were, the, the equipment was overwhelmed. We were testing above capacity. We had, we decided as a, as a country to run the DNO again, to see that uh, if the feedback that we are getting from the lab or from the labs was true. And indeed, uh, when we did our DNO again for 2024, it actually showed us which facilities were testing above capacity. And that informed us where to place uh, uh, additional uh, equipment so that uh, we can now um, uh, ensure that uh, the turnaround time, because those facilities that were now testing above the, their, their capacity, the turnaround time had been affected, was affected, and we needed to bring it back to the one day that we wanted. So this, uh, it really gave us uh, uh, a lot of, uh, of uh, benefits. And from that, that, from what we have seen, we now have it as a guide uh, at Zambia that uh, we need to, we'll be conducting a, a DNO every after two years or whenever we need, uh, we are introducing new platforms that is for the TB and HIV in our uh, laboratory network. So that those that that's an example of that the benefits that we have uh, seen or experienced at Zambia. And uh, we, we do agree that um, what the investments, the efforts that we put in to do the DNO 
where I, I actually worth it because um, it does uh, optimize your system. You even okay. get uh, the gains from it. You get the benefits, and uh, yeah, it's worth it. So that is what I can say for now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Judith. You've unpacked uh, a series of very important points. Uh, so first, it sounds like you've undertaken a very comprehensive DNO exercise, considering the human resources, turnaround time, and equipment capacity, um, and, and that clearly generated cost savings. It's also enabled you to inform alternative contracting modalities. Could I ask, did DNO provide some of the leverage and the data to allow you to negotiate some of the cost savings that you could achieve through uh, reagent rental or all-inclusive pricing? Uh, yes, it actually did. Um, through the DNO, actually the first one that we, we did, uh, it, um, uh, it helped us identify uh, facilities where we needed um, uh, bigger platforms. Because the majority, actually, I can say 80% of our uh, point of care platforms are the four module machines. That's for the gene expert machines. And um, when we did the first DNO, it actually uh, did pick the facilities that had uh, higher volumes, that is both for TB and HIV. And the recommendation there was that we needed a, a 16 module uh, platform. And from there, we got actually. Uh, uh, an advantage to negotiate with uh, with uh, CFAID and uh, through the our PSM team on getting uh, having placement of the sixteen module machines in these high volume uh, facilities and uh, good enough is that with that data that came from the TNO it actually showed that uh, those facilities were able to meet um, the the volumes that are required for for a placement to be to be done. Yeah, so that, that, that was really uh, good. And also it's the same with even with our conventional platforms, uh, like uh, the, our Panthers, the Cobas, because when you are doing the DNO, it actually looks, uh, it does not isolate which uh, platform, but it does in, uh, integrate the platform. And with that, we were able to see which province or which uh, region actually needed uh, extra conventional platform for them to test or the, where we do not need, because you find there are times when um, maybe because like we uh, and Shimra mentioned that um, when we did the lab mapping, we did realize that with uh, this issue of uh, uh, power where we do not have a power backup, you find that uh, you the labs are not testing the way they are supposed to. And instead of uh, thinking of uh, procuring a power backup, the first thing that comes to mind is we need a backup uh, platform, a backup machine. But when you do the DNO, the DNO will tell you, you do not need a backup uh, machine, but you just need to maybe uh, increase uh, the, the number of shifts and or maybe even relocate uh, your, your platforms, because that's what uh, some of the recommendations that we got that uh, we needed to actually re, re, rearrange our uh, testing uh, network to actually get the benefits of that. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Uh, you also highlighted uh, uh, quite an important point on the fact that you've taken feedback from facilities, um, which has enabled repeated analysis now in 2024. This very much points to and, and demonstrates the point that DNO is not an exercise for a single point in time, but rather a continuous approach. And it sounds like you've implemented that effectively. So uh, my congratulations to you. That's uh, really a very compelling way to, to look at the, the DNO approach and, uh, and the positive effects that this can generate. Uh, in the interest of time, I'll just ask one of the other uh, panelists if they'd like to to weigh in on, on whether DNO brought any changes in, to how planning or decisions or around diagnostics were made in their countries. So that's Mozambique, uh, Zimbabwe, and Cote d'Ivoire. If anybody would like to, to add into anything that Judith has uh, so eloquently uh, explained to us. Maybe before the colleagues come in, I can add in a few things on the, the way they were of investment as well. Please do. <laughs> Yeah, so also another aspect like Judith already highlighted, one thing we also noticed by doing the DNO is decision making from a geospatial uh, analytic point of view. Instead of just making decisions, maybe just from the numbers that you have, but now DNO was able to show us 
location where these equipments will be placed and what is the benefit. So even presenting that to the laboratory TWG, we had a visual representation to show them uh, actually that uh, where we are placing this and where the other one is going to be placed, this is the population that will be beneficial to it and how sparsely are these equipments going to be uh, uh, placed based on the, uh, the numbers that are coming from those but also the geo points that uh, were picked and also put into the system added more value and highlighting why the investment was really worthwhile. It also helped us to see that before we look outside the box it's important to look within. For example we had a gene expert machine that is within, instead of thinking, let's use another equipment, but the DNO really highlighted that this very equipment, you can still use it. So indeed highlighting that the investment was really worthwhile and all the effort that was put in place was worthwhile. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, just very shortly, uh, Dr. Pinto, um, Dr. Campira. Uh, okay. Uh, uh, you, is yes. there anything you'd like to add? Thank you. Yeah, uh, uh, thank you, Patrick, and thank you, colleagues. Uh, uh, Zambia, they uh, explain quite extensively uh, <clears throat> how DNO bring uh, changes uh, in terms of planning and decisions. And uh, I want just to emphasize the last thing the uh, colleague mentioned. We uh, can uh, use DNO uh, tool uh, has a uh, uh, a way for, to support our decisions and has the way to uh, also uh, optimize the, the network. Sometimes uh, probably those that has to uh, take the final decision, they do not have the entire picture of what we are talking about in terms of numbers or, or in terms of uh, written uh, text. Uh, but a true DNO or, uh, images and geospatial uh, approach, we can use as a tool uh, uh, all the time that uh, we have to show something. Uh, we did that uh, using uh, uh, the same tool to do advocacy on a TB program to show them that uh, we have uh, already reached the, the numbers of equipments. We have to improve the the screening we have to improve the the patient that we have to reach to uh, uh, speed up uh, the process of uh, screening and as well to reach our uh, target according of uh, Mozambique numbers and we also can use to reallocate the uh, uh, the network is what we are thinking right now how to how to reallocate some uh, uh, HIV viral load uh, equipment and as well some uh, uh, TB point of care uh, equipment to reallocate and to uh, also allow the, the network to become efficient. In terms of investments as well, uh, we can uh, through the, uh, uh, this process uh, to map those uh, areas that going to uh, work with one um, reference lab. It's what we are uh, uh, trying to do right now we have uh, uh, the central uh, hospitals labs that we are going to use as a, a reference lab to the entire network in each region. It's something that also can uh, maximize the investment uh, uh, down uh, 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 to put down the cost of uh, rental agreement uh, uh, contracts and as well to also decrease the, the price that we have to to pay for maintenance and all the uh, additional service. Thank you. Thank you very much, so much uh, Felix. You've pointed to uh, an, an interesting point on, on how DNO can be used to make decisions and to optimize, uh, but also for advocacy. And this is a critical point when we consider uh, integration. The, uh, there's a perception that integration at certain points may result in uh, the, it may come at the expense of productivity or it may come at the expense of uh, cost or, or potentially even at the expense of patients. Uh, and, and DNO can answer some very critical questions that, uh, that help settle those concerns that they can reassure disease communities and, uh, and stakeholders to ensure that they're aware of the potential benefits of, uh, of undertaking integrated approaches. So thank you very much for that point. I'd like to turn now to, uh, to Dr. Guy Damiana Dagra of the uh, Ministry of Health of Côte d'Ivoire. 
doctor, you you undertook a DNO to inform the design of uh, integrated diagnostic testing services and sample referral uh, for access to TB, HIV, and HPV services in Cote d'Ivoire. Taking the evidence and the outputs of DNO into action, as has been mentioned by other panelists, is often a challenge. Could you share your experience around this? Uh, how do you plan to leverage the outputs of the analysis uh, into the future? And do you think that they, uh, there are any barriers that, or obstacles that need to be overcome uh, to, to achieve implementation? Merci bien. Et oui, effectivement, euh, on est actuellement dans un processus de mise en place d'un système de transport intégré et d'échantillons pour le VIH, la tuberculose et HPV, dans le cadre, bien entendu, de la DNO, sur deux régions de la Côte d'Ivoire, euh, avant de pouvoir passer à échelle. Euh, on avait prévu, on avait minimisé en tout cas les difficultés lorsqu'on planifiait cette activité. Euh, ça fait qu'il y a eu beaucoup de décalages avant qu'on ne commence véritablement euh, dans le mois de mai passé. Donc, ça nous a pris pratiquement un an pour la mise en place parce qu'il fallait faire une analyse situationnelle. Il fallait bien expliquer aux responsables de la santé de ces régions-là, les directeurs de santé, aussi les acteurs de la santé. Il fallait les convaincre, leur montrer le bien fondé de l'activité pour qu'ils puissent adhérer parce que chacun travaillait dans son, dans son coin selon la pathologie euh, qui l'intéressait. Et donc, euh, à cet effet, il y avait beaucoup de systèmes de transport d'échantillons un peu disparates. Euh, C'était tantôt les agents de santé communautaire, les PMO, ou même les, les infirmiers, ou les parents de malades même qui cheminaient les échantillons. Euh, donc, euh, c'était un peu difficile de leur faire changer ces habitudes-là. Euh, mais quand même, on a réussi à à mettre en place ce système. Et avant ça, il a fallu les mettre quand même au même niveau à partir de, de la logistique, notamment acheter des motos, des systèmes de chaînes de froid et puis contracter avec euh, certaines structures pour pouvoir faire le transport. Donc, euh, lorsqu'on a fait tout ça, on a aussi signé un contrat de, avec euh, les, les agents qui allaient transporter. On leur a donné une assurance santé voilà, une assurance santé, et parce que c'est des engins qu'ils allaient utiliser. Donc, euh, il fallait les rassurer qu'en cas de sinistre, on était prêt à faire face à leurs problèmes de santé. Et donc, euh, tout ça mis ensemble, on a fini par, par mettre l'activité en route. Et après trois mois, le mois passé, oui, je crois, on a fait une supervision pour évaluer comment les choses évoluent. Euh, J'avoue que ce n'est pas, on n'a pas atteint le pic d'emblée parce que ça a commencé lentement, ça a commencé lentement. Les échantillons de VIH, euh, comme on, ils en avaient l'habitude, ils ont vraiment écrasé tous les autres. Mais doucement, doucement, la tuberculose aussi s'est insérée dans le système, donc ça monte un peu. Voilà, ça monte un peu, un peu, les chiffres montent. Mais il y a eu un petit problème au début, en tout cas entre le VIH et la tuberculose, parce que euh, pour la tuberculose, c'est un diagnostic. C'est un diagnostic qu'il faut faire. Donc, il y a une euh, prise de décision, il y a une prise de décision qu'il faut faire suite au test. Ça fait qu'il y avait une urgence par rapport au VIH, c'était la charge virale qui pouvait attendre quelques, quelques temps sans, sans qu'il y ait un problème particulier. Donc, euh, les demandeurs étaient un peu... Euh, impatient au début quand il n'avait pas de résultats, mais on a pu mettre en place un système d'acheminement des résultats électroniques avant qu'ils aient le résultat physique pour qu'ils puissent prendre leurs décisions. Donc, euh, et le, la fréquence est deux à trois fois par semaine. Donc, euh, ça s'est arrangé et actuellement, les choses ont évolué tout doucement. On fait face quelquefois aux pannes des motos euh, parce que il y en a qui sont nouveaux, ils n'ont pas, ils ne maîtrisent pas bien les engins, on ne fait pas souvent aux pannes de moto, ou bien quand il y a les intempéries, les, 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 les routes qui sont difficilement praticables, euh, mais les choses évoluent bien. On a émis aussi un système, un logiciel pour tracer les échantillons, 
Donc, euh, dès que l'échantillon est acheminé, euh, celui qui, qui doit recevoir à l'information, et puis le, celui aussi qui a demandé à l'information lorsque l'échantillon est traité avec les résultats et tout ça. Et il y a un tableau de bord qui existe qui nous permet de suivre en temps réel le flux d'échantillons qui, qui est transporté pendant la période. Chaque jour, on a, on a, on a l'information, il suffit d'aller sur, sur le site. Et puis, bon, je peux dire que ça va, ça se, ça se passe bien, beaucoup d'espoir. Maintenant, voilà, puisqu'on tend vers la fin de ce, de ce projet-là, de cet essai, c'est un financement euh, d'un partenaire extérieur, de, de, de l'UNICEF. Maintenant, on est en train de voir comment pérenniser cette activité. Voilà. De comment pérenniser cette activité sous quelle forme est-ce qu'on va toujours garder le modèle contrat avec des prestataires extérieurs ou bien on va équiper tous les districts euh, en engins et équipements nécessaires pour qu'ils puissent faire l'activité eux-mêmes. J'avoue qu'on a tenu une réunion à cet effet-là. Euh, on n'a pas encore tranché, parce que, mais la tendance, c'est qu'on ne peut pas euh, choisir un modèle rigide. On est obligé de faire euh, un modèle hybride, voilà, parce qu'il y, y a des situations où l'agent de santé ne peut pas quitter son poste pour aller transporter un échantillon, ça va créer un vide. Et il y a des situations aussi où euh, c'est forcément un pétasse extérieur qui peut faire euh, l'acheminement. Il y a aussi beaucoup de contraintes qui font que, effectivement, on s'est on accordé sur un modèle hybride maintenant. C'est la proportion de chaque modèle dans dans le système qu'on est en train d'étudier en tenant compte des coûts, voilà, en tenant compte des coûts supplémentaires parce qu'il y a des coûts effectivement, euh, et puis la disponibilité des ressources humaines et aussi euh, l'efficacité des résultats. Voilà. Donc, euh, c'est ce que je peux dire à ce niveau-là sur ce qu'on est en train de faire en Côte d'Ivoire et on espère qu'on pourra l'étendre à tout le pays sans trop de soucis. Merci. Thank you very much for those remarks. Uh, you've guided us to an interesting point on the prerequisite to diagnostic network optimization, which is the buy-in from all stakeholders, highlighting that this buy-in beyond the laboratory, beyond the ministry, uh, is quite important. So that would include transport partners involving the community health workers, patients and their families, and indeed the private sector. For another country seeking private sector support for sample transport, at what stage of planning of the diagnostic network or assessment of the network would you advise involving those private sector partners? Uh, that's uh, yes for you to uh... évaluer le réseau. Euh, C'est il y a des on a développé des indicateurs on a développé des indicateurs. D'abord c'est la couverture le nombre de structures qui qu'on avait planifié. Euh, on va voir l'indicateur c'est de voir si toutes ces structures là ont vraiment intégré. Il y a aussi un indicateur sur le nombre d'échantillons qui ont été transportés. Et on fait une comparaison avec les années passées pour voir s'il y a euh, un apport, voilà, s'il y a eu un gain, ou bien est-ce que c'est resté ça, ou bien est-ce qu'au contraire, ça, ça, ça a diminué. Donc, on compare le nombre d'échantillons, aussi les tests, euh, les tests qui ont été réalisés, le retour des résultats, et puis la prise en charge des patients. Est-ce que ça permet d'accélérer la prise en charge des patients? Et puis, voilà. Et puis aussi, il y a le retour des prestataires eux-mêmes. Voilà, qu'on qu apprécie pour pouvoir évaluer sur euh, tout le système. Voilà, donc on tient compte de tous ces, ces paramètres-là avant de passer à échelle pour, pour tout le pays. Thank you very much. Could I ask other panelists, uh, have your countries engaged the private sector uh, following the outcomes of diagnostic network optimization uh, to ensure uh, rapid scalability 
and what were your experience with uh, experiences with engaging the private sector as a service provider or capacity in sourcing? If not engaged, it sounds like uh, it might have been a unique experience to Côte d'Ivoire uh, with engagement of the private sector. I think there have been other countries where we've seen uh, private sector providers engaged, which uh, will certainly provide uh, some interesting insight. And it would be interesting to, to map out those countries. I'm sure those resources are, are available um, from ASLM and, and from the, the broader COP. So this brings us to to the end of our, our the the questions that we had for uh, for panelists. I, I'd like to also open up through the uh, the chat function if there are any additional questions for the panelists. Uh, I'd like to also open open to a larger discussion uh, around some of the the points that you've made, uh, primarily uh, on um, first the planning uh, of of network of networks following diagnostic network optimization activities. Uh, Felix uh, from Mozambique, you alluded to the fact that uh, in the context of response to climate exacerbated diseases, uh, DNO has helped to contextualize and LabNet, LabMap helped contextualize the infrastructure needs. Has that consideration changed the way you expect to see the network designed? Uh, and could you expand upon the, the specific climate uh, driven challenges that you face in Mozambique? Uh, thank you, uh, Patrick. Um, indeed, we we are thinking differently in terms of uh, how to expand uh, uh, our lab network. First of all, we end up seeing uh, that a lot of uh, units that we called labs, in the end of the day, they are uh, uh, collection points. We have to start discussing that and uh, uh, also engage the provinces to reach a common agreement uh, to say uh, this is the, how one lab has to work and based on the uh, infrastructure and uh, conditions that we have, we have to uh, uh, turn into collection uh, site and uh, uh, map all the uh, uh, labs across that uh, specific health area to uh, uh, allow them to be able to reach the uh, services. And as I, I mentioned in the beginning, we uh, we uh, we have the um, sample referral system that covered the entire country and all the facilities. And the idea is to uh, turn in sustainable uh, uh, approach this sample referral system has one uh, uh, service from the lab, even though being a logistic uh, approach. We as well uh, uh, think that uh, uh, training our provincial uh, supervisors in GLLP program that we are engaging, we did the first round for the supervisors, the second round we did the uh, chiefs of the, the labs, uh, will play a key role for a one health approach that uh, a colleague from Zimbabwe mentioned has one of the key pillars uh, to reach uh, 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 the good and efficient network uh, uh, process. And uh, we see a, a potential for a collaboration in terms of uh, uh, public and private sector, because we're going to map uh, 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 all the key areas and the private sector can invest on in those areas that we have gaps because based on our uh, climate change in Mozambique, uh, uh, the prediction says that we're going to face at least three or, or more storms per, per year and uh, we're going to have a different vectors of diseases. We have to be prepared to uh, uh, to offer a service that can reach the, the remote areas in country and uh, collect sample to those uh, uh, district or provincial hospitals that must be uh, uh, run for those samples and also take care of uh, uh, 
of the patients. That's why we are seeing as a potential those uh, uh, different uh, areas to uh, maximize uh, the results from the NO. Over. Thank you very much. So you've you've noted that Mozambique has uh, some climate vulnerabilities that have allowed you to sorry that uh, that have triggered improved planning as a result of lab map uh, and the distribution of your services. That's uh, in the the face of climate exacerbated disease and ex external shocks to the system. Uh, this will be critically important for many other countries as well. And I'm sure there's lessons to be learned. Uh, so thank you for sharing those insights. Next for uh, Judith and um, uh, you mentioned that starting considering integrated testing uh, enables the country to, to, to improve efficiency and effectiveness in the diagnostic network. And this occurred starting from 2021. Did this generate any benefits in planning response to COVID-19? Uh, thank you, uh, Patrick. Uh, so with uh, the time that uh, we were uh, during the pandemic, the COVID pandemic, it's actually what uh, even drove us to get or to appreciate the integrated testing. Because uh, then uh, when COVID came, we now had to uh, use the these uh, gene expert uh, platforms, which are just for TB for COVID as well. And uh, when we saw we saw the benefit of uh, uh, using the already existing uh, resources or infrastructure that we had, and that is what uh, convinced us that uh, if we were to integrate, then we were going to actually um, uh, use our resources efficiently. Because um, Imagine if we had to buy platforms, the gene expert platforms specifically for COVID or for HIV, though that, that's a lot of money. But yet you have these platforms already which had the capacity, uh, the testing capacity available that you could uh, uh, use. And um, uh, I guess it was it was a it was a blessing in disguise, uh, COVID, the pandemic, because it has taught us uh, uh, a lot of uh, lessons on, and also uh, we've now we are now able to think of our sustainability. What whatever we are doing is it sustainable? Are we able and will it respond even to uh, future pandemics? We 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 are no longer just. Uh, uh, disease specific, but uh, we look at a patient in a holistic uh, uh, view. Then, uh, Patrick, if you allow me, there was a question that uh, the one for Mozambique, where you 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 are on the barriers. I uh, I just wanted to add uh, my voice to that. That uh, the barriers to actually the, when you are doing a DNO or optimizing a system, uh, the number one barrier that I actually noticed was a uh, siloed programming. When you have uh, programs uh, putting um, their needs or what they want first and not the patient, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a big barrier to you optimizing your system. We saw it in 2020, so that we even took longer to do our faith DNO because we it took time for the different programs to really accept to say, okay, let's try it. But for 2024, it was very easy, very smooth, because what we have done from 2021 to 2024 is that um, we now have, like at, at, at national level, we now have one uh, person who's coordinating both the TB and the HIV, same at the province. And even in the facilities, we now have the same person who's handling, but before we used to have a TB person for this and the HIV person for that. Even the reporting was in different places. And, uh, and also if uh, for those countries who are thinking of uh, going the optimize, uh, optimization way of for their networks, you need to forego the siloed programming and just think of uh, uh, in, in integrating your system. And uh, the, the only way you can overcome that is to bring all the stakeholders on board and explain to them the benefits and what you are trying to achieve. Because at the end of the day, what we are trying to do, whatever service we are offering is for the patient, is for the client and not for our, our uh, personal needs. Then the other one, which might affect, especially for 
countries which are not uh, using um, uh, laboratory information systems is the quality of data that you put in into your uh, in in the system. If your data is not correct, you the outputs they they will be wrong and uh, and even just from when you look at it, you are able to identify say okay that is no, not right. Uh, we've also even um. Like uh, when Shimba explained that when we were, we've just done our preliminary analysis of the lab map, but when we we could see to say okay that is not making sense, and we were able to call the facility say are you sure what you reported on here, and when that was corrected and everything was perfect. So the quality of data that you put in as you are doing these uh, um, uh, analysis uh, really matters and it can be a big barrier actually for you to appreciate uh, the, the, the benefits. Thank you, that's what I wanted to add. Thank you so much for those rich insights. You pointed out that data is useless if first poor quality, poor quality inputs result in poor quality outputs. I think we can all agree on that. Um, but the, the outputs of DNO uh, are less useful or not useful at all unless they're in the right hands. Um, and it, when they are in the right hands, it's important that there's effective buy-in from all stakeholders to ensure that it's utilized. Uh, the, one of the dangers of analysis is that uh, at early stages, if stakeholder engagement isn't completed and if there isn't buy-in, the outputs won't be implemented. So uh, looking at the chat, there's a quite an interesting question from, from one of the, the COP members uh, on countries that did DNO and when implementing uh, the recommendations as an output, uh, they're asking if DNO showed equipment underutilization or overutilization, uh, how, how that resulted in, in movement of equipment and redesign of the network. What were the, the what are the potential challenges for countries to consider uh, when reassigning the location or the distribution of equipment? And that's for for all of the our our panelists. Um, and I see that's that's triggered some some interesting thoughts. Uh, <laughs> uh, so for Zambia, we actually did get uh, that um, um, the recommendation that we need to move our equipment around. And uh, the movement of equipment within the district or the region, uh, that, that was easy to manage, but the ones where it was outside into another region, that was a no-go. And uh, we tried, but... Uh, Eventually, we just let it go. We just left it as it is. And uh, but what we did was to engage the provinces, the leadership, to say, okay, this is uh, this equipment is being underutilized. So you need to come up with means of sending all the samples, ensuring that it's being uh, used to its uh, capacity. And uh, that has a uh, uh, kind of worked because now the, the, the provinces are aware that um, they have this equipment or machine which is underutilized in their, in, their, in their region. So they are deliberately sending the samples there for testing and also where, where they have one which is overutilized and they are diverting. And also the, the, our load shedding, because currently we, we are only having three hours of power a day. It has also kind of helped us to implement the recommendation from the DNO because those high volume facilities, which are already over um, operating above their capacity, they have power backups. So now those facilities, the small facilities, they are automatically putting, placing their equipment in those facilities, the high volume facilities, because they have the capacity to test even when there's load shedding. So it is some form of um, of uh, how it was done. But otherwise, um, the best is to engage the people in the, in the, in the area and uh, then come up with uh, agree on how you are going to uh, uh, move. Then uh, the question on the partners, for us as a country, when a partner procures uh, an equipment, it's because it uh, automatically becomes the property of the ministry. So when they place it in our facility, that's it. And it is the, the ministry then decides on 
what to do with it or where, where to where, where to move it. But uh, yeah, so as you are even um, implementing or based on the recommendations, you also need to choose what works for your country. And that is where the stakeholder engagement comes in because you have to agree all the stakeholders say, is it beneficial for all of us to move it all, so, or, or not? For example, for TB, TB is not about, uh, um, in some areas, it's all about uh, access. You, they want the, 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 this uh, presumptive uh, TB patient who is in this remote area to be able to access that, uh, that test and not uh, really uh, be concerned about uh, the, the utilization. So you have to weigh the best benefits and uh, and decide what works for you that 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 would be my my actually my, my take on that one thank you thank you so much we have time for one more question for all the panelists uh, i'd like to ask each of you to reflect um very shortly uh what would be your recommendation to a peer country or a, a cop member uh planning or considering to undertake geospatial analysis what would be the one thing that you you would ask them to consider when when going into this process. Uh, could I start with uh, perhaps um, our colleague from Zimbabwe? Um, thank you, Patrick, uh, and thank you, colleagues in the meeting. Um, what I would like to say, I think uh, my sister Judith uh, shared some of the issues as she was giving experiences from Zambia. Um, the most important thing uh, to start with when it comes to DNO exercises is the stakeholder engagement. That is very key. Why is it important? Because you need adoption of the outputs. You need adoption of the recommendations. And you also need um, strong understanding of the outputs. You know, when you come up with uh, DNO outputs, you're now presenting it to the decision makers and they don't appreciate where you are coming from, where you are going, why are you coming with these issues. It becomes very critical. And to cite an example, um, what Judith was saying in terms of relocation of equipment, you find that um, leaders within provinces or districts, they want their machine. They want access to testing, despite the issue of utilization. So it is very key and important to have a strong stakeholder engagement. Apologies for the background. And also, it is important, again, to include the decision makers within the Ministry of Health. Those guys are very important, especially the decision makers those that when they say something, funding is going to be available. You find that some of the recommendations, they require funding or they require movement of pieces of equipment, which also needs um, some authorization uh, within the jurisdictions, you know? So the stakeholder engagement becomes very key. And it is also important Thanks. that in the exercise, we include our implementing partners so that when the recommendations come out, there are going to be things that are going to be aligned with what the implementing partners are doing. And that's going to have a bigger buy-in and it will smoothen out uh, the implementation of the recommendations. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, very quickly, uh, Dr. Pinto, uh, would you agree with that statement that uh, on stakeholder in engagement and on early political buy-in? Yes, uh, uh, Aaron, that uh, uh, the second level is engage the regional or sub-regional uh, uh, managers because they are the ones that are going to be the end uh, point of the branch of any decision that uh, uh, the, the health sector will, will take as uh, guidance. And uh, above all, uh, uh, based on the decision uh, or the stakeholder engagement, uh, this information should be included and uh, um, annually uh, uh, planning and also in strategic plans 
how they go into uh, uh, take decisions how the technical working groups will uh, use these uh, uh, informations and tools uh, uh, to move forward with different uh, uh, activities planned in each country over thank you so much uh Guy damien any final words to add to complement what uh, our colleagues have said ce que ce que je peux ce que je peux dire à ce à ce niveau pour euh, pour aller vite euh, et de façon efficace dans une analyse DNO il faut vraiment impliquer euh, le ministère de la santé qui va coordonner l'activité pour ne pas que chaque programme se sente lésé voilà la direction doit être coordonnée depuis le sommet il faut s'aligner sur les objectifs euh, du ministère de la santé pour que ils puissent bien comprendre l'activité pour vous accompagner au niveau des équipes au niveau des et puis aussi il faut impliquer les acteurs du terrain parce que c'est eux qui vont animer l'activité et ça peut mal tourner s'ils si ne sont pas impliqués dès le début ils ont tendance à croire qu'on vient leur imposer des choses alors que c'est pour améliorer la qualité la qualité de leur travail donc il faut les impliquer dès le début pour avoir des discussions franches et puis ils seront ils vont sentir valoriser l'activité et vont bien mener l'activité au niveau des équipements Euh, il faut aussi parce que souvent c'est le programme a son équipement et il va mutualiser avec un autre. Il faut bien s'accorder sur les procédures de maintenance pour que chacun contribue à maintenir son équipement euh, de sorte que l'utilisation puisse être équitable. Si vous avez la possibilité d'avoir des mises à disposition, c'est important avec les fournisseurs et mises à disposition comme ça, euh, la maintenance est encore plus assurée. Voilà, au lieu des achats où il y a d'autres choses derrière que vous ne maîtrisez pas. Et puis, il faut beaucoup penser aussi au système de backup, parce que dans nos pays, avec les problèmes d'électricité et, et autres, il peut arriver qu'un laboratoire se trouve à, à ne pas tourner à cause d'un problème qui n'a pas prévu. Donc, il faut avoir des, back, des laboratoires en backup. Et enfin, ce que je peux dire, la qualité des données, les données que, historiques qui sont produites par les, les acteurs du terrain, les données qui sont dans les machines, et puis aussi l'épidémiologie euh, du pays. Voilà, il faut maîtriser les données pour ne pas faire des mauvaises prévisions et puis être surpris par la suite. Voilà, c'est ce que je peux ajouter. Je vous remercie. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, what I'm hearing is a theme from all of you is the, 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 the need for a common vision of success between all parties and the early political buy-in at all levels from regional, sub-regional, cross-sectoral, public, private, civil society with very strong stakeholder engagement. Unfortunately, that's all the time we we have for today. I'd like to turn back to the uh, the hosts to for final words and to close the session. Thank you very much for having me as uh, as co-host. Do we have Dr. Maruti online? If not, I'll, I can close the session. Thank you so much, everyone, uh, to, for the rich discussion, the very robust insights that we've received from the panelists and uh, and guidance provided to uh, to fellow countries and, and members. The you've highlighted some very important points about DNO. The primarily the that DNO is not a, an objective for a single point in time. That it requires continuous involvement of all stakeholders. That the benefits can and should be generalized uh, beyond individual disease programs to, to benefit patients uh, in HIV, TB, malaria, uh, and beyond. Um, and that DNO, while it can be used to make basic decisions, it can also be used to, uh, or geospatial analysis can, can be used uh, for basic decision-making. It can also be used for optimization uh, and one does not require the other. It also enables advocacy, uh, resource mobilization, uh, the, the generation of cost efficiencies and cost effectiveness, and it improves the effectiveness of diagnostic networks uh, at multiple levels. Your insights have, have very much enriched the, the conversation, have improved the, the way we understand diagnostic network optimization, uh, and I thank you very much for, for everything you've shared. As you talk more, as uh, Dr. Maruta is back, uh, so I'll, I'll ask him to, to provide the, the closing statement. Thank you again.